This week's podcast is sponsored by our friends at Yamaha. Add more to your TV sound with the YOS 109 soundbar. It might be minimalistic, but it features DTS Virtual X 3D sound, built-in subwoofers, as well as Alexa voice control features, all in a profile suited to wall or cabinet placement. Visit yamahamusiclondon.com for more details. That's yamahamusiclondon.com. Hello and welcome to the Reforms Podcast for Monday the 2nd of March and joining me in this edition, Steve Withers. A brilliant man would find a way not to fight a war. Clocking in at 8 o'clock will be Kaz Harlow and Ed Selly. It's the kind of mission where you get medals but they send them to your relatives. It's it's one of those weeks, the world seems to have gone crazy, the st- stock markets are crashing, coronavirus is really starting to take effect um, in terms of what we've been up to. Lots Aston of night- Villa nearly won a football match. Yeah. Was- Liverpool, Liverpool, Liverpool did lose a football match, yeah. which is yeah. unusual these days. <laughs> but that, but that's it for them now. They're going to storm the rest of it now because they've had that wake-up call. Don't yes. expect them to be so. It's unfortunate they did that on the game where they would have taken the record. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for the it most consecutive. Yeah, but that's win. because that's because they, if you like, I they think were I'm, thinking about it. I yeah, think it was yeah, on their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's not But uh, yeah, there's there's usually TV launches. This is the time of year, February and March, for TV events. We've had a couple that we've gone to, but um, unfortunately, with everything that's going on at the minute and, it, and I don't really think it's responsible for anybody to be travelling as you can expect lots of these things are being cancelled or postponed at the moment um, which could play a little bit longer term in terms of the products actually turning up um, it could have effects on the fact that there's a, supposed to be a European Championship and Olympics I think the main thrust is the Olympics are in Japan which could cause some real issues and they're well, already no, talking European about championships if you want to shift millions of people from country to country and stand in stadiums that sounds like a recipe for disaster to yeah me. it does it does i think with japan actually being close closer to china i think that was the main concern to start yeah, with. but yeah, yes yeah. the Euro- european championships i mean it's in italy now so it's you know it's lots of countries in europe have got it and um yeah. and not always sure quite sure how they've got it so yeah i, I think unless it's you know all gone done dusted by may the European Championships are not going to happen. No. <laughs> There's no way they're going to hold those. No, and then, of course, you're going to have things like factories not working at the moment. I mean, there was a, there was a, a NASA story, was it yesterday? They, they took some satellite photographs over China and there's been a huge dramatic decline in pollution over China, yeah. which, which yeah. is a bit worrying in itself because if China are saying they've only got so many tens of thousands of cases, yet pollution levels are significantly well, they've dropped. shut down lots of factories and stuff just to try and contain it but or it's far worse um, than they're letting on well uh yeah it, i mean i'm absolutely positive it's far worse than the chinese have been letting on <laughs> having lived in china i can guarantee that's the case uh i think the stock market collapse is partly because no one trusts the current u.s administration to do the right to do, do a good job but also um you know this is going to have a massive impact on the world economy um 2020 is going to be hit hard um whatever happens it's going to have a negative impact on the world economy. Just the right time to be coming out of Europe. <laughs> Perfect timing for us. <laughs> Just what we need. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, you never know. It could it could actually be a blessing in disguise. You never know these things, do you? Yeah, what, what, things. what are we still making in the UK that people might want? We start making, oh, we, we're, we're start making service, masks. No, no, we're, we're a service economy now. We've, we haven't been a manufacturing economy for a long time. So, well, we could get back into manufacturing masks, maybe. Or we blue. do make lots of but masks, hi-fi. but masks have no effect whatsoever. Yeah, no, no, I know. Unfortunately, people buy them; they have no effect, and now they can't get hold of them for people that actually need them, like you know, medical workers. So, uh, yeah. I don't. bleach though, bleach might be good. Might buy some stocks, stocks in bleach. Uh, anyone developing for vaccines. <laughs> Well, gold's that usually a good bet, is it not? I'm well, sure. No, but the flight to quality is that gold in US Treasuries is where all the money's been going. Yeah, Berkshire Hathaway, generally speaking, you know, things like that. So, not yeah. hi fi, Ed. Anyway, well, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, Munich Show. That's gone. That's gone, it? yeah. Um, uh, Geneva Motor Show, it's gone. Yes, uh, any, World, any, Mobile any, World Commerce. That got yeah, and any hi fi manufacturer feeling sorry for themselves about the cancelling of Munich. Uh, there was a throwaway comment from um, the BMW Mini PRs. BMW Mini UK is half a million pounds to the bad in terms of sunk costs, and that's just one country of it. So, yeah, I, I think um, if, if people are upset about the cancelling of, of a hi-fi show, uh, I, I guess a degree of realism <laughs> is required. What are you going to do about the lack of German sausage, Ed? Um, I'll go to Aldi, <laughs> uh, honestly. Well, no, look, it's, it's a shame 
Uh, but as someone did simply point out on Twitter, given it seems to disproportionately affect men in late middle age, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it would have been it would have been an extinction level event. So you know, yeah, probably, um, yeah, it, it would have probably wiped out the whole of the uh, the European hi-fi. hi-fi press. And let's be clear about this: it, as we were saying this the last time. It's organisations are damned if they do and damned if they don't in terms of actual associated risk. You're absolutely right. If you're still driving you know, let alone smoking, stuff like that. Um, it, 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 you know, it, unless you have underlying health issues that, you know, it is not necessarily individually dangerous. However, in a collective societal responsibility, simply going, ah, oh, yeah, we'll just lose everyone that's got underlying health issues. That's, that's quite harsh. Um, so, yeah, you, essentially, it's a case of um, uh, limiting movements and stuff. I mean, ironically, I am going down to London on Wednesday, and I am rather still hoping to go and see the live performance of Upstart Crow before they ban public <laughs> gatherings. But we'll, we'll we'll take that as it comes. I, I actually like the fact that there's quite a bit of responsibility being taken by not just the authorities, but individuals as well. And just and, and saying, I mean, me and Steve were talking about this off, off mic. You know, you've got to take responsibility and say, right, yeah, could go to that, but actually, let's be responsible. Let's think about the consequences. There's no rush for these things. They can wait a few months and and then reassess it. So it's nice to see that that is the attitude, and it's there's not a lot of this. I am going to travel no matter what and cause you know mayhem. So, but it's uh, it's having its impact at the minute. It's coronavirus, but for people like ourselves on this podcast and maybe some of the listeners I've been uh, and Steve you'll be the same you will have what's self-isolating self-isolating sounds self-isolating. an awful lot yeah. it sounds an awful lot more glamorous than simply not going out does it yeah. doesn't well, it? I've, uh, I've been doing it for about 10 years personally so uh, it's worked yeah. out alright so far yeah. I'll be about oh, however long I've been doing this job yeah I tend to leave, leave the house that often so I'm alright just stock up with lots of you know non perishables and we'll be good to go. Yeah. Well I'm not likely to catch it with a with a you know fifty yard walk down to spa and back again. So should be okay. I don't know, you see. You don't know. Don't know who was there in that spa before you touching things. Are you simply like, wash uh, your working, hands, that's the basic Working on the principle advice. that most of your other um most of your other uh sort of neighbours don't don't actually venture too far outside the confines of Durham. Um so their their danger of being exposed to, you know, the exotic things is comparatively low. Can I just say, after I moved in here in October, uh, I managed to set the clock on the microwave yesterday, and I honestly rank that as probably my single greatest achievement of the weekend. <laughs> because it's really hard. As all of these things are unnecessarily complicated. Um, so, yeah, I was quite quite chuffed with that. But no, otherwise, I've been uh, working, as is often the case. Uh, I've Unusually, I did actually watch a little bit of telly, which we'll come to at the end of um, come to at the end of the podcast. Um, I have been chasing up where my car is, my next car, my current car, still out the front. Um, I'm also actually I'll take this opportunity to ask for advice uh, to the associated listeners. Sometimes this goes very well. I have got to apply a paint touch-up kit to the rear bumper of my car before I hand it back. Um, The instructions are perfectly uh, clear and legible. I'm not worried about that. But it does state that I should be applying it in temperatures of more than 15 degrees. Now, that realistically is impossible. Can anyone tell me what happens if I apply it in temperatures of less than 15 degrees? And does it matter in terms of handing it back? Yeah, because it wouldn't it wouldn't uh, seal properly. Physically won't stick. Won't dry properly. Don't you um, stand there with a hairdryer? That's well, no, one way, or a gas heater next to it. Um, you know, these they, if you if you speak to anybody that does any of this kind of touch up stuff, it's all about temperature and so on. Um, and temperature makes a big difference with stuff like that. I once had the some work done on my car, which wasn't done at the correct temperature, and within a few weeks it was cracked and peeling away. Right. So, okay. No, that's fine. Point. I shall. I shall find a way of of, of doing it in in, temp, in 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 slightly raised temperatures. So Similarly, Ed, you just want it to last one day, don't you? When you hand the car back and after this is this is true. <laughs> but um, given the exact time it's going back is a bit elastic, it's a bit loose as to exactly how how tight I can do that. So the other thing is, I don't want to drive. I mean, honestly, now I have got those front tires have got one point no six tread of you. <laughs> one millimeters of tread left on them. I, I I you know today I went to my local ASDA. Uh, I don't like. It's not a snob thing. It's just my local Asda is not terribly large. But I, I did a week's shop at my local Asda simply because it's not very far away. <laughs> so, yes, the, the new car really can't come, come soon enough. So yeah. yes, and If anybody wants to know what understeer is, just ask Ed. 
<laughs> no, no, no. I said as it's dry at the moment. All right, so um, all right, yeah, it's, it's, it's not greasy. But um, uh, I did go to ATC loudspeakers on Thursday when it was snowing in the south. Mm-hmm. So obviously everything had stopped. I took one look at it. I thought this probably won't end well. So I'm eternally grateful to uh, a friend of mine who lent me his garage courtesy car to go instead. So um, I motored down to Gloucestershire. Um, absolute fireball of a car a 1.3 litre honda jazz what a thing <laughs> um so although i will say that people give you people get very surprised when they encounter a honda jazz being driven at normal speeds because they're so used to them sort of zigzagging aimlessly around with like national trust stickers in the back people get properly unsettled when one sort of moves around with a bit more urgency so yeah that was that was fine um and no uh i will be uploading february reviews on march the 2nd which given that february is a 29 day month i don't think it's too bad by my standards yeah we'll wait and see if that happens but if it does it'll be uh yeah it'll be one one of your records yeah yeah good uh, steve uh oh, a bit of telly i'm watching a bit of telly a bit of work actually not so much work because i got distracted by the telly filling around my my equipment <laughs> that's not, that's not, you, is it? <laughs> not this time oh, at least okay. uh no not much really yeah no uh it's been it's been a pretty quiet week actually i've got some I haven't, I haven't gone anywhere. I haven't done, you know, uh, quite deliberately haven't gone anywhere. So. Right. Well, I had, a, I had some uh, root canal work done on Friday. Oh, yay. <laughs> root canal? I have never been in so much pain in oh, all my life. Oh, that's seriously pain. Hang on, I thought you chipped a tooth. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 it, my, my dentist is like a car mechanic, right? So you go in with one problem and he finds about half a dozen others. So, Does he hold a cigarette towards the palm of his hand? <laughs> no, not quite. But he said, actually, I need to do this before I, I sort that chip. Um, and he says it needs root canal. He said, we'll just crack on with it now. Yeah, well, you've been quiet this week. That oh, explains a lot. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I have never been in as much. Because he said to me, he said, if it gets painful, just raise your hands in the air and, and let me know. <laughs> You're going to get massive jazz hands. <laughs> my hands were waving like mad, and it, I was almost screaming. The tears were running down the side of my my face because it was so painful. So what do they actually do in a so, root canal? I, I don't know, but it's bloody painful, and there's lots of drilling. So actually, sorry, you reminded me. I went to the dentist. I, I, I was last week, last weekend. I was eating some pizza, watching um, Jojo Rabbit. I think it was, and uh, chipped a tooth. <laughs> but luckily, yeah. it was at the back rather than like yours right at the front but yeah. anyway i popped in a dentist on monday morning and uh they stuck a filling in um 150 quid thank you very much so out of the door 20 minutes is, later is it worth me pointing out at this point that i am uh 39 years three months old and i don't have a single filling well, well that's amazing no well that's you don't eat a lot of sweets yeah. i don't eat a lot of sweets i no. also have my rear teeth heat sealed it was something that german dentists used to do um, and that wasn't terribly pleasant at the time, but it does seem to have made a significant difference. Yeah. So, yeah. Because I don't think you've been yeah. taking... Well, you're reasonably careful with your dental hygiene, though, aren't you? Well, yeah. I, the, I always find that mouthwash is the key because it just it voids, you know, build-up and stuff. But, um, no, I, I wouldn't describe myself as fanatical about it. But, yeah, I'm, I feel very fortunate listening to all this. It's all good. Yeah. So, obviously, I, I've picked up on the wrong dentist because he's got a load of <laughs> work lined up. So. Is he d- Dr. Lecter? <laughs> cost you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's not cheap. Right. Um, and the car's gone for a spa week this week. So I saw that. So I, I'm looking at mine thinking, I suppose I am going to have to see if it's still blue at some point. <laughs> but it's, and the back seat where my son has been... Um, it, it honestly, you know these, those documentaries on Channel Five where they visit hoarders' houses. It's like that, um, or, or like Top Gear, the old Top Gear where they used to do the you buy the second-hand cars and then they'd have the scientists go in and try and find <laughs> what, what was actually in there and snot. And well, yeah, I, 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 I don't doubt that the, the car is largely snot <laughs> at the back, but uh, it's all to be dealt with. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not cleaning it until such time as I got a, a given date because otherwise my son will ride in it and just decide to smear something else in there so I'm just leaving it for now yeah well it's that time of the year It's uh, the car's over a year old now so it's get serviced this week and it needed to get the uh, to go into the detailer to keep his guarantee running on the coatings and stuff so yeah and the dentist as well so it's been a really bloody expensive week for him. yeah <laughs> I imagine it has been right let's crack on then uh, current competitions um, we can all do one uh, and uh, I'll kick off. So uh, you can win a competition of the Santa Shake on Blu-ray, 5th of March. Win a copy of Gemini Man on Blu-ray. That's open until the 10th of March. 
We went a copy of Holiday on Blu-ray, also open to the 10th of March. We went a copy of Maleficent, Mistress of Evil on Blu-ray, 10th of March. We went a copy of Raining in the Mountain on Blu-ray, also 10th of March. You can win a copy of all of Criterion's February titles, which I can't bother to look up right now, uh, on Blu-ray, and that's open till the 11th of March. And win a copy of Zombieland Double Tap on Blu-ray, 17th of March. Lots more competitions are open and uh, being added daily by cast. So head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions uh, uh, where you can enter even more, and they're all open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Ed, any previous competition winners? Yes, there are. Uh, Vader 100 won uh, the Criterion's January titles on Blu-ray. Richard Tyler won a copy of Hotel Mumbai on Blu-ray. And then, in a case of magnificent nominative determinism, Public NME 2273 won a copy of Boys in the Hood on 4K. So, uh, well done to you all. I had to look at that a couple of times before I could understand it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're just all getting old don't worry yeah it's fine. okay well, we're back in a sec with some hardware news and reviews okay so uh, a couple of news stories to go through before we get on to uh, doing some hardware reviews um some interesting stuff so free view play um it's been promised on android tv devices for a while it is now available um so Freeview announced that um last week and i have no doubt that all the separate android tv manufacturers who have devices and so on uh we're just waiting on the press releases coming in to say when this stuff's happening, if it hasn't already happened. So um, if you have got an Android TV, like a Philips or a Sony, um, they should have the free, full free view play if they haven't already. Um, I know that Philips were waiting on this happening, so their TV should be getting updated. So um, I've got to say, I, I really like free view play, Steve. Um, it's, it's, it's one really of the good, systems. Yeah. yeah, And it's free as well. I, I know people forget, <laughs> you forget sometimes, but free view play, I mean, the clue is in the name, but uh, it's genuinely free and it's a really good app as well. It, it collates everything into one place. So you've got the iPlayer, obviously, ITV Hub, all four, My5, uh, CBS, uh, Catch Up, UK TV Play, uh, and Horror Bytes, and it's all in one location. Obviously, generally, you can find those as well. Most uh, manufacturers will have them as separate apps, but the idea that having it in one place makes it a lot easier. Um, and makes it very easy to locate content you want to watch. So it, it's it's a great, it's a great little uh, feature, and um, and it's, it's I think long overdue as far as Android goes. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's good to see that that's been added. Uh, another good news story. Obviously, this is before uh, you know the present situation that we're in. But OLED finally reached one million sales in a quarter, uh, and that was in Q4 of 2019, which is. I, I guess it really shows that it's it's now heading towards mass market. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised given some of the deals that are going around <laughs> in late November. Oh, there's some cracking uh, deals. Did you see um, <laughs> the Philips 804 at the minute is, I think it's £1,099? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's I mean, cracking value. I, I think once, once you start getting regular price points below a grand, that's when it really starts to move into the yes, mass market it, territory. It's the psychological difference between a three-figure price tag and a four-figure yeah. price tag on so many different things. 55 inch screen sizes too so it's not a small telly um, no 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 that, that's actually you know that, that's going to be a psychological price point as, um, as Ed's just pointed out and uh, yeah. we'll see well, obviously yeah there are factors affecting it might affect it this year um, but um, it's certainly good to see uh, good to see uh, I mean I think we, we were discussing this weren't we over, over, um, over CES that uh, you know there's not much more you can really do as far as no LED TV goes so getting cheaper is going to be the obvious next step yeah, yeah, and I think it has to get cheaper before they then look at maybe investing, if they are going to invest any more in development with it. So, mm. it's it's at that at that point at the minute where it could go one way or the other with it. But um, yeah, it's cracking technology, and the prices just get cheaper. I mean, it. I've got a seven five four turning up from Philips, an OLED seven five four, for review. This OLED eight oh four is actually cheaper. <laughs> At the minute, at this exact minute, then the 754. And the 754 was supposed to be Philips Ultra Cheap OLED. So it just shows you that there's some deals to be had at the minute. Um, oh, yeah. yeah so. so there we go. So that's some good news for OLED anyway. So uh, 1 million units, exceeding 1 million unit sales in quarter four. And then uh, a story, I don't think we touched on it when the news broke that Bowser Milk and CEO left. Um, I think it was between podcasts, so we didn't actually... Um, discuss that, but uh, Bowers and Wilkins are going under a restructure at the moment. Um, so there's a couple of exec- executives have left the company. They've brought somebody in to 
uh, basically the job is to restructure for uh, either administration or sale. In this case, it looks like it's going to be a sale. Um, and it looks like there's going to be some movement there, Ed, with Bowers and Wilkins. I don't think it's anything to panic over at the moment, um, but they obviously need some restructuring done. Yeah, I mean, it's very, very unwise to say, to speculate or things like that. But no, um, the sales of uh, Bowers and Wilkins' core products remains very, very good. And by core products, I also mean um, they are now significant players in head the headphone market as well as conventional loudspeakers. What is probably not an unfair thing to say is if um, there were grand aspirations of the formation platform possibly moving the brand to a whole another level, I, I think it's fair to say on feedback I get from dealers and the like that that realistically hasn't hasn't occurred. Uh, essentially, the key thing is this separating from uh, EVA or EVA automation. Um, in the wake of uh, the name and Focal tie-up and their, in the investment in them by a, a venture capitalist group, I have every suspicion that a number of other organizations that in venture capital started looking at other hi-fi brands and going, mm, yeah, I wonder if that could work. Uh, with the best one in the world, what um, Name and Focal has achieved, uh, which is a significant growth of and, and moving into uh, moving into sort of slightly different categories and so on and so forth, and largely doing so in a fairly assured way, uh, I don't think that's type standard. Um, I do think that this, if nothing else, is is possibly a demonstration of believing that with a bit of you know Gordon Gordon Gecko esque sort of get up and go that you can significantly change the path and destination of of, of one of the you know the the elder states statesmen of, of, of the hi-fi industry and I just don't think that that works um, and uh, it, it's also a demonstration that if you are going to try a sort of heavyweight expansion process um, if you look at the building blocks that Name and Focal had for example so there was a speaker company and an electronics company uh, with various production options and so on and so forth. It sort of made, they, they had the scope to do this. Boa is very much a speaker manufacturer, which it also was doing some headphones and so on and so forth. So the, the scope to push on from there um, was a bit harder. I mean, obviously, you, it's not to say that this is an entirely, fa you know, it's not it's not just a, a one-way ticket to failure. I mean, you look at um, the collation of Harman Group and things like that, that actually looks very practical uh, well, and so on and so forth. The other thing with Bowers and Milkins is that obviously this is going on in the background. It's more back end of the business stuff because if you look yeah. at, at what has been going on, they've had one of the most successful quarters ever um, yeah. recently because they've got their partnerships with the likes of Philips where they do the audio for their TVs and so on. And also automotive. They are huge yes, automotive at the very, minute very well. in terms of again, Maserati and McLaren and so on. That's a speaker manufacturer doing things involving speakers it's yes. a it's a, a very logical thing for them to do um uh so you know that that that's a, a, a clear area of, of of yes as you say that's where it can go very well i mean don't forget that there are car manufacturers half air manufacturers that have ha been taken to the cleaners on um on on moves into automotive audio so it's not a given that it works but no boas has done very very well there um it's a case of looking at picking the fights you can win and if this leads to Boas refocusing on what it does best I, I actually think in terms of long-term security that's probably the best option for them yeah and I think that's the way they're going to go uh, it's the logical way to go so hopefully uh, yeah it all plays out well um, for them best of luck uh, mm. and we'll see we'll see where things go over the next few months right so that's the hardware news out of the way uh, so let's move on to reviews um, I should have a review next week I'm busy busy beavering away I've been doing lots of video stuff recently which is why um, I haven't had any reviews up at the moment but I am working on the JVC um, N5 which is to be yeah. fair though Phil if you'd done one last week surely you'd have been off your face on painkillers and it would have just involved it would have just been involved some, some yes. weird metaphors yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> a general lack of direction and purpose and lots of swearing yeah yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but anyway, I've been I, I have been doing the reviewing side of things, so not actually sitting writing and so on. I've actually been using the kit, so uh, I've watched quite quite a bit of content recently. I will um, never catch up. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, it's a bit that people forget about. You know, you, yeah. you say oh, I've I've got this sample, and when's the review coming? Well, once I've had time to set it up, sit down, and maybe spend a week or two playing with it and using it as normal and seeing what it actually <laughs> performs like. It's like. 
you've got that in for review, get the review out tomorrow. No, that, sorry, doesn't work like that. Um, it's certainly not here anyway. We actually get the stuff out of the box and use it. Um, so anyway, I've been looking at the JVC N5 cracking projector. Um, been really impressed with it actually. So that review will be coming up soon. And I've also been playing with the Yamaha, uh, processor and power amp and, uh, really enjoying myself with that. It's, uh, it, it's an absolute powerhouse. This amplifier it's really impressed me. Um, so that'll be coming up as well. Uh, Steve, you've been looking at projector. I have. Yes. Uh, slightly cheaper than the N5. Uh, basically, uh, if you're in the market for a projector and your budget's between two and three grand, uh, or you know, less than three, basically, um, this is the one for you, in my opinion. Uh, it's the Epson EH-TW9400. Now, you did the TW9300 last year. Was, uh, it, was it last year or was it the year before? It may have been the year before, actually, yeah. I think it, it was, was the year. Yes, because this came out last year, so it would have been the year before that. Um, this came out sort of September last year, the 9400, so it would have been probably late the year before that that you did the 900. Uh, if you're wondering what the difference is, not a lot, if I'm being honest. Uh, I think there's 100 extra lumens in the brightness. The, which, which you're never going to notice. No, which you're not going to notice. The uh, claimed <laughs> to contrast ratio is 1.2 million to 1 as opposed to 1 million to 1, where that's using the dynamic iris. I don't know about you, but the dynamic iris appeared to have sod all effect most of the time, <laughs> from what I could tell. Uh, and uh, nice one feature that is worth having, though, is that now... Both HDMI inputs are full spec HDMI 2.0 with HTCP 2.2. And last year, or the previous generation, should I say, were one of them was 1.4, wasn't it, Phil? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these are 2.0 Bs, are they? Uh, yes, yes. So you can take anything, you know, 4K, 18, 16, gig, 18 gigabit per second, 18 yeah. gig, anything, anything, you know, 444, 12-bit, whatever you want. But Excellent. it was 10-bit panel, obviously. But it's yeah, it, I, I fed it, you know, the full whack signal, and it took it. Uh, so no problems there. Um, you can get it for currently. You can get it for two thousand five hundred and forty nine pounds, right. which so, for what you're getting is a bloody bargain. So I think the the main competitor here is a projector I reviewed on the podcast a few yes. weeks ago, which was the uh, BenQ W fifty seven hundred. So two different technologies. Um, yep. So it's a bit like well, it is a bit like LCD versus OLED. You got you've got LCD here, three chip LCD versus uh, single chip DLP. Um, so they are different in the way that they do things and they have their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, where uh, DLP works really well is with motion. It has yep. excellent motion. And 3D is usually absolutely spot on with no crosstalk or whatever because of that motion. And, uh, and obviously with it being single chip, um, and it doesn't need great glass to look really sharp and so on. It, it can get away with having plastic lenses to keep the cost down and still have a nice sharp image. Um, the downsides are color volume is not great because it uses a color wheel. Sometimes you'll see rainbow effect, although they've managed to cut down on that um, with these generations with RGB, RGB color wheels and so on. Mm -hmm. But colors uh, not necessarily great, although the, the BenQ is for a DLP projector very, very accurate uh, with SDR content. Um, where it really struggles is with wide color gamut uh, because even adding in a filter it was struggling to get out wide. And to put that into context, DLP in the past hasn't really been wide enough to color Rec. 709, no. which is the HD standard. So it's it's only now that DLP are actually covering Rec. 709 properly, pushing it any further than that, and you lose a lot of accuracy, and it can't really push it out. So this is where three LCDs should really work well, because this should be one of the strengths, Steve. It absolutely is. Um, yeah, so it's a three-chip three, three chip LCD projector, um, and... In terms of color color gamut coverage, uh, the uh, DCI-P3 coverage was 97.65%, 98%, uh, and 76, well, 77% of Rec 2020. So very wide color, color um, gamut coverage. Uh, yeah, so having se seen the um, 5700, five, um, the other thing, obviously, is that this is a lot brighter. It's not the brightest projector, the 5700, and the 9400 is a lot brighter, even with the color filter in place, which obviously does diminish the brightness a little bit. Uh, so in terms of um, pros and cons, you have went through the pros and cons of, obviously you, you didn't mention the cons of DLP, but there's things like, um, well, apart from the lack of, lack of uh, color gamut coverage, uh, you might suffer from rainbows um, if that's if you're unfortunately afflicted by that. With DLP projectors, that's obviously not an issue with a three-chip projector. Um, the Epson's brighter, it's a color wider color gamut, as I've just said. Uh, and um, it's not as good with motion as, as DLP. Um, not as I mean, the 3D was good. I did test the 3D. The 3D was good. There was a bit of crosstalk, but obviously it was a lot brighter, which I think always makes 3D look a lot better. So, you know, it's pros and cons there. Um, 
the, the great thing about this projector, I mean, in terms of its uh, SDR performance, uh, really accurate, um, pretty accurate out of the box, very accurate out of calibration. Um, really nice natural looking picture, nice and detailed. It's not native 4K, nothing below five grand is, but uh, but the, uh, the processing it applies to give you a, a slightly high resolution image based upon a 4K source looked really detailed, looked really nice. Uh, so the picture quality looked great, the, the detail was excellent, uh, the color accuracy was really good. Uh, so that was great. And then on the HDR stuff, the tone mapping it was applying really worked well. So again, you know, I mean, it's not going to look as good as a TV, but uh, but for a projector, it was a nice uh, a nice projected HDR image. I mean, you know, I'm used to using the N7, and the N7 is over three times more expensive. I'm not. I don't think it necessarily looks three times as good. <laughs> so so it was a really strong performance. I thought for a projector that only cost two and a half grand and. It's worth remembering that you're getting a lot of features on this projector that you don't normally find at this price point. So, motorized lens cover, which is important because one of the downsides of LCD is it doesn't have a sealed lens, a sealed light path, so you can get dust contamination. So, obviously, this helps. Plus, you know, make sure you mitigate that by you know not putting it in a really dusty place or trying to keep the room red for your dust. But that is something that might happen. I'm not saying it will, but it's something you need to be aware of. Uh, so it has a motorized lens cover. It's also got motorized lens controls and lens memory. So if you're using a scope ratio screen, you can have different aspect ratios. Yeah, it's got calibration. It's got calibration controls, um, ISF, triple C controls. And it's it's a really, really good projector at a really competitive price. Yeah, I, I don't think you can argue um, if you are a movie fan um, and you want to you know, have that kind of performance for that kind of money, you can't go wrong with the Epson, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I was using it in a pitch blacks cinema room um, and it was holding its own in there the blacks aren't as good as a jvc or even some of the more expensive sony's but it it, it was holding its own in that room uh, and i think you know, that, that t- testament to the quality of a projector at that price point that it can do that um if you are using it in a less than ideal conditions uh, you know say you've got white walls or whatever then you might want to consider getting the 7 400 saves off a bit of money because that's bright but i mean you know, you're not going to lose as much in terms of contrast because because the situation could be the environment won't be won't be ideal anyway but uh, for a for a dedicated room, this this is and if you you know, say say a two to three grand budget, this is the projector to get in my opinion. And um, gaming wise, we can't forget games. Uh, twenty six millisecond, twenty six point. Right. Okay. I'm just I'm just uh, twenty six point eight. Number. Uh, yes, you know, looking at the review. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the input lag is twenty six point eight milliseconds, and fan noise twenty dB from where I was sat, okay. which is only a yeah. couple of feet That's from the projector. Really yeah. So really quiet projector as well. Uh, yeah, it's hard to fault to be honest. I mean. What did I, I mean, like I said, the light path's not sealed. The blacks, you know, are, are good for an LCD, but, you know, are not as good as, say, a JVC what was, or uh, Sony. panel alignment? Good. Actually, very good. Uh, the panel alignment was very good, actually. Now, again, that can be, that can vary from machine to machine, so potluck, really. Um, but but I, I thought the panel alignment was very good. Like I said, the, the sharpness of Im- the images, uh, even, you know, with the 4K source, but also with, with um, 1080p sources, was really good. The upscaling was good. Motion was, uh, was okay. Uh, again, it's not a strong point. That's just nature technology, but uh, yeah, I mean, really, uh, at two and a half grand, it is absolute stonking value for money. I don't know how they're making. I don't know how they're making money on this. Motorized lens cover, motorized lens memory, HDR compatibility, ISF C3 certified, 3D, 3D support, um, fast input lag, <laughs> input lag. Uh, yeah, it really is impressive. Well, I mean, obviously, scale, isn't it? Basically? Obviously, Epson, Epson are the largest. So many projectors. <laughs> world's largest so yeah kind of is a scale working in their favor there but and again we're talking about two different technologies when we're talking about the benq and and the lc3 lcd um you know the three lcd is gonna suffer in a a living room like you say with white walls white ceiling and all the rest ambient light where that's a strength for dlp normally um so but yeah you kind of complain at that money really can't complain and there's not a lot of competition at that price point either steve well, like like you, like you started this conversation with the the, uh, the projector. That's the obvious alternative is the W five seven hundred, which is I think the same price, roughly, just slightly yeah. maybe slightly cheaper. Um, so that's the that's the obvious alternative. Um, but I having spent time with both, in my opinion, that the Epson is is this is the superior model, superior projector. I think not just in terms of performance, but in terms of, in terms of features as well. Yep, so uh, no complaints there. Uh, Epson, if you're a movie fan, if you want to build your own home cinema, it's going to be a, a bat cave. You want to use a different aspect ratio screen and so on. It's the one. 
really. And the motorised lens cover should cut down on problems with dust blobs as well. So as long as you're careful... And motorised lens isn't... controls are a godsend because trying yeah. to focus something from the projector itself with oh. a focus ring is a pain in the ass. You can stand yeah. at the screen and do it with a remote control. It is so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, so let's move from projectors to speakers and hi-fi speakers at that. And I've got to say, I've never heard of QDOS Titan 505 stand mount said. Never heard of the irony being, of course, they're made up the road from you. Well, there you go. Yeah, they they are they are County Durham. Um, no, Kudos is uh, it's not a large company. I cover this in the review, and uh, to be very clear, in terms of technical sophistication, there's no, it, one of the last sort of expensive loudspeaker reviews I did was the Focal Canter Number no. One, and that's got beryllium and composites and all manner of of things that have escaped from the world of aerospace and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the kudos isn't that. Uh, it's it's a much more prosaic piece of engineering. It's got a soft dome tweeter. Uh, it's got uh, a pair. Uh, it may not look like it, but there are a pair of uh, paper drivers on there as well. Uh, and despite that, it costs £7,000. Um, the reason why I've had a look at the speaker is goes all the way back to the um, Dynaudio Special 40, which I re- reviewed some years ago and awarded a perfect score. Uh, since then, it's been a case of how much further up the price points you have to go to be decisively better than that speaker uh, in in stand mount terms. It's a fixed point of you know design reference. So you know the Focal is a better speaker than the Dyn Audio, albeit not quite as subjectively perfect. Uh, and it's a question of how much further then up the food chain do you have to go to make a speaker which is decisively better than the four and a half thousand pound Focal. And I suspect that this is the last waypoint on that journey where there could be any level of, 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 of agreement after that you disappear into the realms of subjectivity of people looking for different things in different products but nevertheless from the moment that I heard a set of prototypes running at a Bristol show a couple of years ago uh, this is um, a seriously impressive loudspeaker um, ignoring the um, the use of some unusual aspects of design it's an isobaric speaker which is i cover in the review um and it has quite a clever baseboard arrangement it's simply the attention to detail that has gone into its construction and the result uh, i'll be honest it's it as far as i'm concerned uh you can make uh, an objective case for it being almost entirely viceless in a uk lounge um it uh, delivers a level of a level of uh, performance and frequency response where, honestly, I don't know quite how much more you'd want. Um, it's annoying because I'm not in the same lounge as I was when I reviewed the Dyn Audio, as you know, various aspects of my life have changed since then. Uh, the Dyn Audio in my old lounge did 29 hertz before it dipped below plus minus 3 dB. Um, which is ridiculous. Um, there is an element of, of augmentation in that room. This speaker in this new room managed to get to 34 hertz before it dipped below plus minus 3 dB, which for a two-way stand mount is still uh, highly impressive. And I suspect if I got hold of a pair of Dyn Audios again, they wouldn't get down to 29 hertz in this room. Um, so what you've got here is getting on for all the frequency res- controlled frequency response you could realistically want in in two channel audio terms um coupled with a speaker which manages to be detailed spacious incredibly tonally accurate but just as importantly it's enormous fun um which is something that high end speakers can occasionally miss it it ca- the the review pair turned up just after another pair of stand mount loud speakers had gone through which were 10,000 pounds a pair and whilst they could quite easily tell me the color of the underwear that the artist was <laughs> was wearing at the time they simply weren't anything like as entertaining to listen to as these speakers were um we will <clears throat> in the fullness of time look at what happens when kudos makes a more affordable speaker than a seven thousand pound speaker and i am at pains to stress that um most of the rest of the speaker reviews i've got tentatively penciled in for potentially quite a a a, a patchy year in terms of what turns up and what doesn't turn up in terms of production and so on and so forth um this is probably seven thousand pounds is probably as as high as we're realistically going to go but um it's a it's a feedback answer to a question you know 
what happens how much more money do you have to spend to have a speaker which is decisively better than a two and a half thousand pound speaker we tested a while back that simply delivered on every level um just as a very quick aside if you are still umming and ahhing over a pair of done audio special 40s you don't have a lot of time left as i understand it if production hasn't already finished it finishes imminently they weren't on display at the bristol show because they are not part of the 2020 model year however there is still not a single speaker i tested for under three thousand pounds i'd rather have so if you were looking for a pair of stereo loudspeakers and they were on your radar you need to get move on uh because they they aren't going to be around for much longer um but nevertheless the kudos review will be going up i fully anticipate some probing questions like how can they possibly cost seven thousand pounds so and so forth uh just read the review and if you've still got questions i'll do i'll do my best to answer them it's a case of demonstrating what can be done when you apply relatively conventional engineering perfectly rather than reaching for metal made from supernovas and stuff like that it's it's a seriously impressive piece of kit but we will be looking at more terrestrially priced objects henceforth for a bit um i'm a pain to stress the most expensive of the four objects uh, that will be uploaded tomorrow is uh, two thousand eight hundred and fifty pounds, and one of the items being up- uploaded is one hundred and thirty pounds, and it's one of the best of its type I've ever ever encountered. So we've got more sensible things in the pipeline as well. Okay, there you go. Uh, that's our hardware reviews. Um, it's end of the month, so before we go to the film section, why don't we go back to Ed uh, playlist, album, and vinyl of the month, Ed? Right, um, album and vinyl are the same. It's been quite a good month for releases, but there is one that that stands out for me. Um, It is by an artist called Grimes. uh, I knew you were going to say that. Despite her name, is actually a lady. She's actually Miss, Mrs. Elon Musk. I don't know if they're actually married yet, but he's uh, he's put her in the family way. So I think they're um they're, they're doing reasonably well. Uh, she's um Claire Boucher or something like that. Um, but this latest album, <clears throat> the uh, snappily titled Miss Anthropocene. Uh, if you don't like what Grimes does, uh, I'm afraid that this isn't really going to be any significant departure from, from what's gone before. It's a combination of impossibly delicate vocals, some quite, quite clever arrangements, but basically overlaid over some raw electronic fury. I mean, the opening track, So heavily, I, So Heavy I Fell Through the Earth, has been on heavy rotation in terms of test work I've been doing here and so on and so forth. Um, if you are going to buy it... I don't believe that the special edition version is worth the effort, uh, and the conventional uh, vinyl release is, um, is is the one to go for. The reason it's also my vinyl release of the month is because since her last album, Art Angels, uh, she has changed label to 4AD, and if there's one thing that 4AD almost always get perfectly right, it's the quality of their vinyl releases. They are always... It's the equivalent of... Um, of your Criterion, um, of your Criterion eight, uh, Blu-rays and H, uh, 4K Blu-rays, everything they do in analog is sensationally good. Uh, I always get excited about Dead Can Dance. They uh, did the bulk of their work on 4AD, and that's why those vinyl releases are, are are reference quality as well. So it's a rare example of a mainstream commercial album. It's it's is it a recording for the ages? It's 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 a great recording, but it's still of electro. If you want, you know, if you're looking for key aspects of tonality and so on and so forth, it's 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 electronic noises of a nature you probably haven't heard before. So actually, using it as a point of reference is tricky. But the physical quality of what they've achieved is is unquestionably very impressive, and it's bright pink. So you know, it's not it's got a lot of different <laughs> things going for it. Uh, playlist uh is um was was easier to do uh unusually it's tidal tidal someone uh was obviously unchained from their desk for long enough to um to, to actually turn out something quite interesting um i've been on a bit of modern classical uh sort of bent recently uh you can judge me however you like for that um but i started listening to a, a few different things and then there was uh, i found a playlist that rune recommended as a result of that called the avant garden uh which is uh, a selection of of music of this nature it's 56 tracks long takes six hours to do um 
like any of these playlists, you ain't going to like everything that's on there. I certainly don't. But as a jumping off point to some of the work that's being done on where electronica ends and modern classical music begins, which is, I have to say, I think a very one of the most creative areas in music over the last 10 years. Um, there's some really, really good things to listen to on that. Um, and uh, some of it's in Tidal Masters as well. So you'll get a bit of, bit of high res goodness if you've got either unpacking the MQA on Tidal or you've got an MQA compatible DAC. Okay, there we go. I've got to say, Grimes has been on um, uh, regular regular mm. play over the... I think it was last week you, you told me about it, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, so, over. Yeah, yeah. so I, I've been listening to that quite a bit. Nice. Yeah, nice it's... Album. Um, it's uh, I mean, I, I still think, in terms of moments of sort of joy, Art Angels that came before um, is possibly the happier album. I mean, that may or may not be a reflection of living with e- Elon Musk. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a good album, a very, very good album. It's, it, it, it's well well worth a listen. Um, I also, as a room, um, like all the streaming, streaming services, it collates and goes, well, oh, you've been listening to this, give this a go. It um, recommended an artist for me last night. Let me bring her up. It's called Poppy Act. So it's not a new album, but nevertheless, uh, I was I've been listening to her work over the weekend. Unbelievable! It's music for a film that hasn't happened yet. Uh, whoever in one of the one of the, ve- the the production houses suddenly becomes aware of what she's been doing. Mark my words, Miss Ackroyd will, will will score a film before too long. It's absolutely outstanding. I've got to say, um, we're going to come on to it a bit later. The TV stuff. Um, and you know how I like my documentaries. Well, the BBC Four have been doing a, a few of these programs where they they look at certain albums um, yeah. and go back and speak to artists. And one that I'd completely forgotten about until I actually watched the documentary, which is Songs from the Big Chair, which is Tears for Tears for Fears. Yeah. Um, what a fantastically Fantastic produced album, album oh, that well, is! Yes. It's, um, it's stunning. It's, it's from the golden age of being able to spend. <laughs> yeah, you, you, years. you get you get one good release under your belt and the studio goes yeah take as long as you like and then yeah. essentially that came to a, cr- a crashing end with um talk I, I don't know if they're going to cover it or if they already have talk talks um uh spirit of eden which essentially after they'd recorded um color of spring the record label went yep yeah, off you go just 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 deliver us another masterpiece and talk talk did it was just a masterpiece that took it takes about eight listens to get a handle on it and had no identifiable thing that you could call a single. So, you know, in yeah. terms of 1989 traffic. So unfortunately, Talk Talk ruined it for everyone. But yeah. Songs from the, from the Big Chair is from this golden It only took point. them two years. So it was two yeah. years between the heart and, uh, and then... Uh, songs from the big chair so but it's just such a fabulously yeah. produced album it's yes. fantastic and the way that they actually talk you through each of the tracks and you know the thinking behind it and and how they played about with different sounds because you know it's, again it was early use of synths and, and electronic and that kind of thing yeah fantastic so if you watch the documentary then go listen to the album again because uh I'd, i've been having that on high rotation this week as well mm. Yeah, it's, it's really, really good. Um, there is a reel-to-reel remaster of it, which is about four hundred pounds. It's like, <laughs> do you know what? It's pr- it, it's a rare example of an album I actually quite like, where it's probably it's probably does actually show some of the benefits of it. But I don't necessarily know if I four hundred pounds like it. So you know, <laughs> one for another time, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Right, we'll be back in a sec with film stuff. Okay, moving on to films, and um, once again, the Odeon managed to get £19 out of me. Is it 19 or 18? I can never remember, but they got money Not out me. of me. Cancelled mine in the end of last year. Did you? Uh, yep. See, I, I keep meaning to do that, and now I think, oh, actually, I'm going to go this week, and then something else will pop up, or the weather gets bad, or whatever. It's that That's the main thing at the minute. It's been snowing a lot here, um, so actually going to the cinema's not really uh, worth, worth the hassle. Oh, your car it isn't. No, kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, I haven't been to the cinema, and if you got rid of your card, you won't be paying money, Steve. So, or not? I guess that just falls down to cars. Yes. Uh, why is that not a surprise? Yeah. Thanks um, for um, thanks for you know giving us the time and turning up. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> um, yeah, middle of watching some TV show, were you? <laughs> no, I had to deal with the kids. Uh, they're, and they're still up. But yes, yes, this is, uh, it's been a hectic weekend. 
Um, you sound absolutely burnt out. Can I just say, it I sounds am. like if you've seen things, things you wouldn't believe. Yeah, it's a bit like <laughs> that. No man it's should a, see. <laughs> it's a bit like that Apocalypse Now, Hearts of Darkness thing. We had too much time and too much equipment, <laughs> and it all burned out. We went insane. Um, films of the month. Are we going straight into films of the month? Well, I was. I've been you in the are. cinema. <laughs> Good none of us have. This month, yes, I've seen countless numbers of films. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so, then. so I would, I would put Parasite up there as being one of the best ones. Ah, you just oh, seen I that have, the I have seen Parasite, although not at the cinema. I watched it on Blu-ray last week. But uh, it was you, a fantastic. Oh yeah, because you get everything from the states, don't you? It was a fantastic film. I really, really enjoyed it. it was really good. Yes. Oh, yeah, God. that would be that would be my tip for the film of the month. I know it won the Oscars, but it won the Oscars after my review. In no small part, thanks to my review, I'd like to think. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought it was uh, very clever. I, I love Snowpiercer, so I, I, you know the director and the the um, the star. I I like them both from what they've done before, um, and I I tip that as my film of the month alright ok good stuff uh, right so films opening this week what can we go and see at the cinema if, if can, but we're not going to cinema what yeah. can other people go and see <laughs> you can go and see the latest Disney Pixar Onward uh, Elves and Magic and lots of in references on Dungeons and Dragons um, Tom's reviewed that so the review's already up because it actually previews this weekend but it's not released till Friday uh, a couple of films recently have done that, like Doolittle and this. I, I'm not entirely sure what the logic is behind previewing for a couple of days. Well, I, I went to see Jumanji movies. on yeah. the preview weekend. It was nice to get in and see it early and then not have to bother. Yes, yeah. I mean, it works out well when it's good. I'm not sure the people who saw Doolittle early felt the same way. <laughs> but um, but Onward sounds good. Yeah, Disney Pixar. You can't really go wrong, but I haven't heard much buzz about this one. It's, no, it it seems to be quite quiet. I haven't seen anything trailer wise. Well, mind you, I haven't been to the cinema for a number of weeks, so I've probably missed the trailers and stuff. But yeah, I haven't yeah. seen it um, being promoted in any way. Talking about uh, you know Disney Pixar, I finally got round to seeing uh, Toy Story four last night. <laughs> so well again, done. so again, I'm only nine months behind the, the curve, but um, yeah, I thought I enjoyed that. I thought it was really good. You're always back in time, Phil. It's like when well, last Kaz, week we discussed like Spider Man into the yeah, that's my disc disc of the month, by the way. Um, so yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's one of these things, though, because you would think I, you know, a lot of people say this to me: "Oh, you you review TVs and that? What's good to watch? You know, what what are you watching at the minute and stuff?" I don't watch any new TV because when you're reviewing stuff, you watch the same crap over and over and over and over again. It's stuff that you know so well, you know, so inside you got a point out. Point of reference, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. And and it's it's the same review and audio stuff as well. I mean, obviously you can add new stuff in there, but you always have stuff that you know so well and so inside out that you go to and and listen to or watch or whatever. So that's what happens when you're reviewing. So actually sitting down and and getting through the pile of discs and that kind of thing, uh, I'm trying to make the most of it at the minute because I've got a good setup in the, in the cinema room at the minute. So I'm trying to get through that. So that's why it's taking so long. But anyway, getting back to point. Yes. Uh, was, onward. You can go and see Onward if <laughs> you want to. Uh, or you can go and see Escape from Pretoria, which has got good reviews. That's Daniel Radcliffe. Um, or you can go and see Blumhouse's Fantasy Island with uh, Michael Penner. Not sure what to make of that, that based on the trailer. Well, Fantasy that, I mean, Island wasn't a ho- I used to watch it when I was a kid. It wasn't a horror film. No, it just seems, series, seems to be a, a trend to doing this at the minute because what was the one they did uh, a few months back? Um, it was a kid show back in the 70s. Um, oh. Yeah, the um, Banana Splits. Banana Splits. They, they did something with that, didn't they? Yeah, they, it, yeah. they made it in a horror film. Maybe, maybe well, it's just one of these things. I think that's that's your limited choice of the month. Is that, well, is that the one where you said the plane, boss, the plane? Is that the one? Yes, yeah. that's the one. It's been a bit odd recently at the cinema. <laughs> I would say we're all waiting for the ramp up, which goes like Quiet Place, Black Widow, um, then Top Gun. No, and, uh, no, no, no like it, Bond, No Time to Die. That's the first. Uh, okay, okay. First big release, isn't it? I mean, I suppose there's a Quiet Place, but that's not really a blockbuster. No Time to Die. That's the big one. That's what I'm waiting for. That, I will Wait, go. Is that, is that April? Is it? Yeah, April the. I, I mean, I, I will see it, but three hours of of oh, just three long. hours. Yeah, it's almost three hours. Long. Yeah, it's, it's a it's the longest it's running Bond it's ever. Long. Yeah. yeah. What? The pre-credit sequence yep. is supposed to be like forty minutes long or something. The pre-credit sequence. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. 
like, oh, what happened to the days when films were a nice tight ninety minutes? <laughs> it's yeah. because they Hang couldn't on. they couldn't cut anything out without it not being able to tie up every other Daniel Craig film in a way that made sense and took into account everything they did wrong in the last movie. Yeah. That's why it's three hours long. But there isn't anything to really recommend, is there? I mean, it's a bit meh. We're going to go and maybe see Disney Pixar. We're going to maybe see Escape from Pretoria, but catch it on Netflix, really. And Fantasy Island. Mm. It's a bad yeah. time for the for the studios because a lot of big budget films that they were hoping, like Doolittle, for example, and Birds of Prey, they were hoping would make some money in China. And of course, all the cinemas are shut in China. So uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the studio releases around this time of the year, um, and presumably going forward, I mean, you've got to think what, what will happen with, say, Bond when it opens. Um, the coronavirus is not just impacting you know, the things we're talking about at the beginning of this podcast, but it's seriously impacting global box office at the moment in terms of cinema. Well, what they should do is just shove it all out in streaming services. <laughs> That's what we'll end up doing. <laughs> Netflix was rubbing their hands. We can, we, can all, yeah. <laughs> we can all self-isolate then, can't we? Watch Netflix. That's what I spent the last four days doing, actually. It turns out. <laughs> uh, right, so that's what's coming up at the cinema. Uh, disc-wise, um, Terminator Dark Fate out in 4K. Anybody seen yeah. it yet? Yep. Yes. Any good? The I, I went to the, the cinema film. to see it, so I know what the film's yeah. like. I went to the cinema oh, the to disc, see it. The disc is spectacular. It's a 2K upscale, but it looks fantastic. It looks I mean, good. So it's not the best I've seen, but the soundtrack is absolutely mega. <laughs> is it uh, another IMAX enhanced one? No, no, it's just a uh, normal Dolby Atmos. Good. I say normal. It's just, yeah, it, it's a nicely balanced, not dialing up everything to 11, too much space, <laughs> IMAX mix. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what they should, they should have on their, their packages, shouldn't they? IMAX enhanced DTS plus 11. It's the DTS have been pulling this trick for thirty years, haven't they? Yeah, well, I went I twenty years. Yeah. I mean, when did DTS when did DTS first launch? It was mid mid nineties. Mid nineties. Uh, Park wasn't yeah. it? Jurassic Park. Now, it did, now they did have a, a higher bit rate, so it was something like fifteen hundred yeah. kilo. But they also didn't they also second. dial it up by four dB or something? They did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, you know, if they ain't broke, don't fix it. It's really worked for them in the past. But yeah, the IMAX mixes I've heard, and particularly because Zombieland Double Tap was the first. Uh, theatrical film I'd heard with an IMAX enhanced soundtrack and um, yeah it's just it's just Bay City basically on all the channels as far as I could work out yeah um, um, have they have they spent any time between cinema and disc uh, improving any of the effects or whatever or have they just left it as it was they haven't done any more well, in, in Dark Fate Dark Fate yeah well I mean, the effects weren't terrible I mean some well, of not. There was a... the, that factory fight was was really bad no, it was I whenever he sort of jumped. No, I didn't think the effects looked bad. There were a couple of moments where he he was like jumping around. It was clearly CG, and he had no weight to him. But I thought the opening sequence uh, is the best de aging I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, that was yeah. flawless. Yeah, I don't know. I, thought, I don't know I thought... what's talking, so that makes it easier. But it was utterly flawless at the beginning. I mean, it's you know, it it's, it's like... a bummer if if you're a fan of T2. It was, <laughs> but, uh... it was like cleaned up footage that yeah. they excised from T2. This was, this was, these are outtakes we, from T2. That no, sorry, I, th- I thought you were on, a, I was on about the factory fight at the start. Yeah, I know you, I know you were about that. Yeah, but I mean, there is a bit of CG here and there that, you know, that doesn't look as good as it, it could. Um, I, I'm sure it's just a time factor, but overall it looked pretty good. I think you forget in a movie like that just how much CG you're watching, because I agree when he jumps in the factory... It, it looks. It's it's not it just that there was a, there was a couple but... of hits where she's using the pole on him, and there's there was a couple of hits where he's around, and and it's just so obviously CG because it's not fluid movement. It's the same as what um, in Gemini Man where he jumps on top of the car, and you could tell where it transitions from human to CG. It's just it. Yeah. There's something about it. It's just uncanny valley. It's just not quite right. You know what I mean? So that's what put me off anyway. And the other thing that kind of put me off the film a little bit was there's a lot of repetition. Now, I don't know if they do that on purpose or not, but that whole opening sequence with uh, having the chase on the freeway, I mean, yeah, that's, out of T2. that's T2. <laughs> it, was. it was basically a remake of T2. <laughs> but I think I think they engineered it quite well. I mean, it was a very tense set piece, even if, even if it was... I mean, there, there was something about it that didn't quite work for me, and I think uh, Steve, I think you picked up on it as well when we did the cinema review, and that was geography. There was something about the chase that just didn't seem quite right in terms yeah, of they, they you didn't, didn't know they, exactly they kept, where you were. Um, they kept cutting to the them inside the the, the cabin of the van or car. Yeah. They were in like a pickup truck, aren't they? So they, yeah. they kept cutting them close ups. So you didn't really have a sense of where they were relative to the car that was the, to the van or the truck with the snowplow thing. 
why they had a big plow thing in Mexico City, God only knows. Um, it was chasing them how far away it was. So unless you had a sense of geography and where one vehicle was in relation to the other, you didn't really get a sense. There wasn't as much tension. I mean, if you compare that to the same chase in T2, you always know where the two vehicles are, and yeah. therefore there's more tension associated with it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that was just my personal. Anyway, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll pick the disc up. I'm, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it, you know, it'll look and sound good, and there'll be some sequences to use that I'll put in and I'll watch over and over and over. And Basically, the two air, the, the I mean, aircraft. I, the aircraft. I, after... After Genesis, I thought I thought we should be grateful for this. I mean, it's the fir- it's the first time I felt that kind of imposing dread of an actual unstoppable I Terminator. C- in like I cannot remember years. anything of Genesis. Well, it's bad. And the funny thing is, I remember seeing it at the cinema and the eighties kind of riff at the beginning where they rework it. I remember thinking, oh, I quite like this. And then it just all goes to tosh yeah, in the first nano Terminator, John Connor, weird performances and utterly dull Michael Bean. Rep, um, oh, Jake Jai Courtney. Yeah, he's Mr. just zero charisma. Awful. And Amelia Clark. I mean, I had no. Looks about for, ten. Although that same problem with uh, Dark Fate. It is, the, yes. The, 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 rule, yeah, the leader of, the, of Resistance, it looks twelve. Yeah. And I think no one's going to follow her no. to a bus stop. Never mind. They, Anyway, uh, so uh, Dark Fate Terminator or Terminator Dark Fate, it's out on uh, 4K and Blu-ray. What else have we got Blu-ray wise, cards? We've also got uh, Doctor Who Collection 12, not to be confused with Series 12 because that's coming out later in the year. So Collection 12 is coming and Adam's Family, the uh, 2019 animated reboot, which has actually had some reasonable reviews. Okay, uh, so let's move on to our discs of the month. Well, you know what mine's is. Uh Joker does look well. You, why didn't you go? You go. Oh, I'm going to. Was Joker I'll, this month? Last yes. month. It was last yeah. month. Yeah. <laughs> well, February. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's my disc actually, Joker, because I did buy that, and it looks absolutely and sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I get. I get why Joker. I haven't actually picked it up yet, but I get totally why Joker. But I'm going to go really left field and pick Terminate Dark Fate because I think it looks and sounds amazing, and I actually was pleasantly surprised by it. I, okay. I did. I did really enjoy Joker. I, I've yet to go back into it because it did leave me with a couple of things that were a bit frustrating. Yeah, and, I, it, and I, it doesn't instantly pull me in for a rewatch. Whereas I was straight back on with. I, I, I get that completely, and I was kind of the same, Kaz. Um, but there was an offer on a, on Amazon on launch week. I think it was down to seventeen quid or something. Like that. And I thought I'd, I'll buy it anyway, and I'll get round to watching it. And I actually watched it a lot quicker than I thought I was going to. And, and I was just going to dip into the disc and I actually ended up watching the whole thing again uh, in one go. And I've got to say on second viewing, because I'd, the only time I'd seen it was in the cinema, I got so much more out of it on second time around. Um, it's definitely worth a second viewing. And on as good a system as you can possibly muster. Um, and it, I was noticing things in the sound mix and in the soundtrack that I hadn't noticed in the cinema release. But the sound design is just absolutely astonishing. It is superb. There's always something going on. It's just so realistically done. And some of the panning and steering effects, um, again, it's not something I really picked up on much, but I guess in the, whole, in the home environment, you're listening a bit more and you're taking a bit more in. And there's a bit where he has a dream sequence uh, or a fantasy sequence. Um, you never know if it's <laughs> if it's fantasy or not because he's, you know, he's narrating the story and he's not a very uh, reliable very narrator. Very reliable narrator, yeah. Yeah, so you never know if it's the truth or what. But there's one scene where he's on a, ta- a talk show and he gets asked to come down from the audience to the the talk show host, and the camera moves around him, and is and as the band the band is playing, and as the camera moves around, the the band moves with the camera, and it's so well done, and it creates this three hundred and sixty degree sound field. And there's another scene where he's sitting outside a hospital on a bench, smoking a cigarette, and again, it's just the use of ambient effects. It's the and it puts you right there. Um, so yeah, in terms of sound design, I just thought it was spectacularly good. Um, and it and that soundtrack, I forget the uh, the composer's name, the young girl, I can't remember her name, but again, it just it fits. It's not something you could sit and listen to without the images, but when you sit and listen to her score with the images and and with the cinematography, um, it's it's really it's fantastic. Uh, 
really enjoyed that disc and, and I enjoyed it on a second viewing as well so I would highly recommend it okay well you're going for Joker and Kaz has gone for um, Dark Fate Dark Fate so I'll go for Zombieland Double Tap which I thoroughly enjoyed and looked and sounded great nice let's move on because it's TV and streaming next and um, this is where we'll, we'll spend most of the rest of the podcast talking uh, so first of all TV and streaming releases this week Kaz yeah we've got Apple TV Plus's uh, release of Spielberg's Amazing Stories uh, I haven't heard a great deal about it but it's got Spielberg attached to it and Apple TV Plus has been pretty consistent with decent output so far are these I mean, the direct successes to the ones from the yeah. 80s, 90s? yes, yeah. right. yes. so okay. I think I think that, I mean, they they haven't got much content, but what they do is worth watching. So unlike, let's say, Netflix, where you have to try and find the gems in amongst the rest. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'll be checking that out. Um, and that's all we got. I'm surprised that I haven't seen any more promotion of this because they made a really big thing about it when they, uh, they launched Apple TV Plus at their big press conference. They even had Spielberg on stage, didn't they, um, yeah. to launch this. But there hasn't been that much hype since then which is quite surprising for Apple because if anything you would expect them to be running TV ads and everything else to, to push people over at the platform so you know, does that tell a, you something about it? It costs a lot of money though doesn't it? I mean, This, I is, this see, is Apple though. <laughs> yeah I know but I don't see much promotion for, for any of these things I think you know it, ever since their flagship launch I don't think... I don't know really... I, I'm seeing an advert, every advert break at the minute for Disney Plus launching at the end of this month. Have you, uh, have you got your 50, 50 quid... I, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy it this week. Yeah, I think it's, I but think it's it worth the week? value. Yeah, I think it's worth value for me. So, so I think, I think that that's the thing. The key is Disney Plus is trying to do it to entice new subscribers. Apple TV is like, well, forget it. You know, we, if you don't know about it, then you're not, you're not in it. So, uh, I don't know whether they're gonna. What waste a strange money. approach to marketing that is. Well, you know they've they've blown all their marketing budget on their on their on the initial launch. I, I don't, I don't much... think I don't think Apple have blown any budgets. I think Apple, if they wanted to put the money into it, they would be putting the money into it quite easily. I don't think they're that type of company, which makes me think that it's not worth promoting. Which is the point I was trying to get across. That yeah, maybe... hopefully, hopefully it isn't the case. But you could be right. I mean, it's it's not the first time that something with Spielberg's name attached hasn't gone desperately right you're all right ed sorry that was um thinking of chris crystal skull <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh well that's a thing he's pulled out the next uh direct in he the has, next indie yeah. movie hasn't let's he? hope he they has. get rid of um um harrison ford next no <laughs> love let's, of god let's please have... bring someone younger in <laughs> let's just not have any more indie films I mean, yeah that, that would be let's... the best thing yeah, yeah. after crystal skull they should have just i really don't it. want to see a succession of younger actors try and be Harrison Ford as Indy, which is no doubt the way they'll go. I mean, it, it didn't go particularly well with like Solo. I don't think that they they need to have anyone impersonate him, and I don't think it's a character that you can really rejig and have go again. Why not just make the best of all of the other stories that they have out there? They got Uncharted they could do. That's very Indy. Well, it's, it's Rick some... Dangerous from the Amiga. Basically, <laughs> you know, there was a, a worrying thing um, the other day. I'm, I mean, I'm hoping it's just a deep flake um, thing and, and it goes away. But uh, they had Tom Holland taking over Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future. Yeah, with, yeah uh, that was just done for a joke. Yeah, well, hopefully that is the case because it, it, you've got now news channels picking up that there, there could be rumours of this actually happening. Which Back to the Future is a perfect film. Yeah, uh, it doesn't there mean is anything. Literally, though, no does it? point. It's like trying to remake Jaws. I'm what sure I think they've already talking about doing. Yeah, they're doing These films Jaws, are perfect. They did Robocop. They what are we nailed, talking about? Yeah. Back to the Future is perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's a perfect screenplay. It's been. It's it's like a finely you know crafted Swiss watch in terms of its screenplay. The performances are bang on. The direction is superb. I mean, there is no point. Just watch the original. I just, I just think that that that's never going to change. I mean, have all these re- remakes done well or been successful? No. <laughs> Remake yeah. something that was crap. That's yeah. the thing you should well, do. We, we had this discussion. Let's, not go, let's yeah. not go down this one again. We yeah. had this discussion. Yes, people should be looking at films where the premise was good, but the execution utterly yeah. indifferent yeah. And, and mining those. I yeah. mean, you know, whether that means that Johnny Monomic or whatever is to a, um, a, 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 a revisit, I can't possibly say. Yeah, I mean, just put Keanu in every movie. What, what, you mean get him to redo all just of his everything. crap old films? Yeah, just do everything. <laughs> Go back. 
Yeah, just go back. Right. Uh, TV shows of the month because time is uh, swiftly moving on. Um, uh, just trying to think. I'll go first. Uh, Top Gear, completely back on form. I am absolutely loving the chemistry. Uh, I am really enjoying the program. Uh, it's, it's, it's doing what Top Gear should do. The chemistry between the three of them is absolutely spot on. They're also touching on subjects that I, uh, I think they should be touching on. I mean, tonight is Colin McRae's um, Subaru uh, from 1995, the world uh, championship winning Subaru. Chris Harris gets to drive that. Um, I just know that that is going to be a fantastic piece of television. Um, and they've made a really good job with the series so far. They haven't outstayed their welcome. I think Flint Toff is a, a, a nine against the guy, but I hadn't seen much of him um, other than his Giacomo adverts. And... Uh, and to be honest, I thought it was going to be a disaster, and it's been anything but. So for me, it's a real highlight. It's something I'm looking forward to watching. As is um, the air crash investigation. Um, this series has been incredibly good. Um, it always is good. Um, and I can sit and watch it at my leisure now with Sky and, and so on. Um, and I'm trying to think. Else. I, I mentioned it before. There's some really cracking documentaries on BBC4 as well, like the albums and the story behind the album. So like I say, this month it was Tears for Fears. Uh, any interest in that, go watch it, because it's, it's always quality television. Steve? Well, um, I was going to spend this weekend watching uh, um, Altered Carbon. Uh, I watched a couple of episodes, and I was enjoying it. But I got completely sidetracked, because Drive to Survive Season two's back, and this season they've got McLaren and Ferrari in it, and it is brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> Don't ever let it be said that Germans aren't funny, because the team chief at Haas is a comic genius. He's, te- <laughs> he's technically an Austrian. Uh, is he Austrian? Right. Yeah. He's a comic genius. Don't care where he comes from. What's this? I, uh, I think I've ever Formula, heard of this. Formula, Formula One. Formula One. Survive. Yeah, on oh, Netflix. Right, okay. It was going to be my call. I mean, because you don't. I mean, I think Steve is living proof that you don't necessarily have to have an no. enormous amount of interest in Formula One to find it utterly compelling. It is brilliant. It's the way it's been assembled. It's, it's uh, and it's so funny at times. <laughs> uh, there's there's some real laugh out loud moments in it. Um, and yeah, it, it's. Uh, I mean, Formula One's always been a soap opera. And this just proves it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's that'll be my choice for, for the month. Although it's been other good stuff as well, but that's that's uh, that's that was that's been an absolute treat the last couple of days. Uh, anybody catch uh, Hunters yet? Not yeah, yet. I watched it, all uh, of Hunters. A number of my watched. friends have pointed out that it's absolutely outstanding. But I, I say, got I, I didn't get sidetracked by Drive to Survive. I thought I will watch that. Um, and I, I have this nasty habit of listening to music, as you know, which always completely <laughs> yeah, but I, was, up. I, I was going to uh, jump into it now. I noticed that the first episode was feature length, which kind oh, of oh, they're all off. really long. Are they? Are they? Well, <laughs> they're all really long. Yeah, yeah. It's like an hour and a half for the first episode. The rest of them are all at least an hour long, and the last one's about an hour and a half. It takes a bit of a, um, you know investment in time. But uh, I watched a lot of that on the um, on the TW nine four hundred actually. Uh, it looks fantastic. It, you know, it's four K HDR if, if you can find it. You have to go looking for it sometimes on uh, on Amazon. But uh, yeah, Pacino. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a lot more comic book than I was expecting. Did you watch it all, Kaz? Haven't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's I mean, a lot I'm... more comic book, but I did thoroughly enjoy it, and and it's got some interesting twists. I was pleasantly surprised. I saw the trailer and thought, this I did see the big twist good. coming, though. I have to say. Halfway through, you <laughs> do, you do. Yeah, I'm not gonna say what it is. I just think I laugh. I thought I think I know where this is going. <laughs> well, I think they throw it. They throw it away. But anyway, that's. Uh, I uh, I did really enjoy it. I was pleasantly surprised because I thought the trailer made it look awful, and it looked a bit teeny. You know, Al Pacino hosting up a, um, a, a what felt like a bunch of kids uh, to, to hunting for Nazis. But it's very Jordan Peele. And it's very uh, macabre in some of its flashback sequences, and um, darker, darker than I expected. And plus, as Steve says, it's very comic booky. There's a lot of kind of exploitation flick graphics thrown in, just for kicks, and it, and it gives it a little bit of a flavour. I was I was pleasantly surprised. And Pacino is a good fit. Okay. He makes it work. Uh, it, it depends whether you laugh at his accent or not. <laughs> I happen to think it's nice him. Keeping this consistent accent for the He's whole just doing the same character he played in one time in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, basically, shooting. Yeah. we're talking yeah. about really bad acting and accents. I want you to come on to um, Picard because we haven't spoken about it since uh, episode one. We're now halfway, halfway through the season. I haven't watched any of the others. You can't, yeah, you have you not? No. Okay. Well, we can't talk Picard. You can mm. talk about his accent, though. 
but I haven't watched any of the others. I'm I'm I'm, I'm fed up with um, a binge watchable single arc story being split into episodic chunks. Forget. That. I'm enjoying Use it. The... I'm enjoying the fact that on a Friday night I can go and watch Picard. Yes, I'm on sorry, the I completely disagree. I I do enjoy actually having time to think time to process and then coming back and doing it again yeah i've been it enjoying also, it this season yeah it's um i i for everything that i do want to just turn up as one big chunk of uh, of television that there is still very much a time and place for certain things to be entirely episodic in nature yeah. now i'm well, not sure it's any good though <laughs> this is what i was coming on to and and without getting spoiler uh heavy at all i'm not going to mention any spoilers but I'm having real problems relating to it um, because it's, it's not the, Star the, Trek. Yeah, it's the radical change in shift yeah. in the universe that this exists in over Star Trek of of old. Yeah, especially ones where John Luke Picard was in it. It's yeah. uh, it, it's gone from being a sort of pleasantly, if unrealistically, utopian group of people biffing around in big clean spaceships to a sort of weirdly firefly I don't think it's the same universe as Next Generation. I think it's a, it's a complete... Because there's so many... And again, without getting into spoilers, there are so many rules that are being broken. Um, and just, just to throw one in there, the, the, the concept of money mm. doesn't work the same way as it does in the Star Trek universe. Well, it was restri- so, restricted to the Ferengi and so it was all dirty. So yeah. it's it yeah, it's it's like there's a lot of things that that don't sit well if if you know the 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 universe and I'm not a Trekkie or anything like that, but um that I'm I'm finding it difficult just to put my finger on it. Um that's not to say I'm not enjoying some of it. I think there's some good acting in there, some bloody awful acting in there. Um there's some some nice ideas. Um, and I think I know where it's going. Um, and if you watch it's Red, taking its bloody time to get there, isn't it? It is. But if you <laughs> if you watch Red Letter Media, I think they've they've yeah, got they it. Bang it. On. They're big Star Trek fans. They are, yeah. and They yeah. really know what they're talking about. Whereas, because I'm a, just a, you know a casual Star Trek fan, I can enjoy it partly because I'm ignorant of what's supposed to be. Yeah, same here. Star- same here. So yeah, but it, but I also think that I don't know, um, Patrick Stewart looking pretty old but i know he's meant to be playing old but there are times when you think like oh don't run mate you're gonna you're gonna do yourself an injury <laughs> yeah, um yeah. It's, it's you know he seems to be out of breath a lot of the time and he hams up something chronic last week yeah that french <laughs> accent for somebody that's supposed to be french <laughs> and have a vineyard as well. oh yeah <laughs> i forgot that he's supposed to be <laughs> french isn't he <laughs> I'd completely forgotten he's actually meant to be a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's yeah. stuff like that, and you just, it, it's like the, the hand plant on the face, isn't it? You just think, no, that, you, you, you can tell, and Red Letter Media point this out, the people writing this, they don't know anything about they Star know Trek. about as much about Star Trek as I do. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so yeah, yeah. if you ask me to list all the things I know about Jean Luc Picard, it'll be like you know, drinks Earl Grey tea and you know, hot, um, yeah, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And, and and they did one by one. They've listed all that. All, <laughs> they just delivered all that stuff. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of shows that are, tonight's the last episode of the eleventh series of Doctor Who. I shall watch it after this podcast, and that'll be me done with the show because it's crap. <laughs> now it really has gone downhill in the last two seasons. I thought that twenty um, years ago. No, it was. It was. I definitely. Particularly the Matt Smith era, I really enjoyed. I thought it was some fun. Um, well, as usual, Moffat had a Stephen Moffat had a bad bad habit of writing himself into a corner, but um, but it, there was yeah, it was some entertaining plots and and it was exciting and fun. But this, I, I, it's not because she's a woman. I just find um, Jodie Whittaker's interpretation of the character or, or the character she's being asked to play basically more to the point, and the writing just isn't delivering the same kind of fun Doctor Who that you'd expect. It's um. Yeah, Doctor Who should always be you know, you know, the smartest guy in the room, or the smartest person in the room, should I say, these days. Smartest person in the room and, um, you know, uh, be in control. But that, the character now just seems to be sort of, you know, just bouncing from one disaster to the next and uh, doesn't feel the same anymore. And I just, it's, got, it's got very preachy. In the last two seasons, very <laughs> preachy. So uh, I should watch tonight's episode and then I should wash my hands of it. Can I just say as an aside, it reappeared on Sky slash Now TV. Band of Brothers came back. Love put the Blu-ray of that. Just to say, yeah. episode, episode 7, The Breaking Point, probably is my single favourite hour of serialised television 
I think I've ever seen. It it is that there's not a single wasted second in that. It's not an hour actually. It's, it's forty odd minutes when it's. Which episode's that? Which one? Uh, it's, it's it's one of the Battle of the Bulge. Oh, episode. when they were in the in the forest in the cold. Trying yes. To survive, yeah. It's yeah. it's just it's out it's utterly outstanding and it's from this is the problem I just get I get so easily waylaid by um by stuff I just reminiscing about like watching random episodes of South Park or entire series of Taskmaster so the entire the, 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 the task of actually watching new television I will get around to watching Hunters um I just need to actually just not get distracted which is <laughs> harder than it sounds I mean this is yeah. the problem with on demand TV uh, it's just yeah. and obviously. Steve Masterchef's kicked off. Yeah, that's um, just kicked off. Um, I, I don't know 100% about the change to the format for these heat shows. I, I'm not completely... I I preferred it when they they started by having a box of their own stuff. They eliminated two, and then they cooked their own stuff. But I dare say it makes a saving for the program if they have to bring their own ingredients with them for the first <laughs> thing. It's probably quite a useful saving. It's like, oh, I'm going to do scallops. Actually, no, when I have to buy the ingredients, I'm going to do lentils. Um, so obviously I've been watching that. Uh, it's it's still good television. It's still beautifully shot, still beautifully edited. Um, but that and Top Gear are about the summation of things that I'm watching in real time on terrestrial television. Although that's still 2-0 till, till to the BBC over everyone else. So. I'm going to say I've, I'm quite, uh, quite like this hypothetical. I'm getting into that. I think it's quite quite enjoyable. Oh, I haven't really given that any attention yet, but it's all on UK TV Play. So, But again, Dave really deserves credit for working out how you do original television on on a very tight oh, budget. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, um, oh, Better Call Saul, times. by the way. Quick mention for that. Better Call Saul's back, season five, two episodes in so far, and it's it's excellent. Okay. Uh, Kazi, anything else to add? Because you watch a uh, shit ton of TV than everything else. We do. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, Hunters was very good. Um, Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone is a bit hit and miss. There are a couple of really good episodes, but there are a couple of very slow episodes, and they should have stuck to the half an hour format, and no one can beat Shatner. So I don't know why they tried. <laughs> um, and uh, Netflix did a show called "I Am Not Okay with This," which actually Stu pointed me towards. It was on my um, uh, it was on my reminder list, but uh, but I didn't realise it was like seven twenty minute chunks. Basically, uh, they've taken a feature film and they've split it into chunks. It's um, it's kind of Netflix does carry light, but with a very witty um, Buffy esque tone to the dialogue um, and it's the girl from It, the new remake mm. Sophia Lillis and she's she's really good in it and, and it's it's worth checking out it's very much a prologue towards what uh, is obviously a bigger thing it's based on a graphic novel and I suspect there are lots more stories to tell but um, but it's not bad but my, my choice of the month is, I mean after I mean, having been a fan of it for the best part of two decades, and my choice has got to be Altered Carbon. Um, I was all over second season of Altered Carbon, uh, picking it apart, seeing what bits from the books they'd adapted, you know, getting to the next screen. It was it was really a, an enjoyable run. It's eight episodes. It's not quite as good as the first season. Anthony Mackie isn't as good as Kinnaman. Uh, but then again, Kinnaman wasn't as good as the other people playing the same character. So, you know, you, you have what you have. But it's still a wonderful universe with some great kind of future punk Were you, tech. Did you see uh, M.G. Buses did some of the episodes, directed some of the yes. episodes? Oh, right. Yes, two, two of the episodes. Uh, probably the best one was Nightmare Alley, actually. Uh, and, um, yeah, M.J. Bassett directed that. And one of the other ones, I can't remember the title of it, but um, so for those yeah. that don't, for those that don't know, the uh, Andy Bassett that writes the news for AV forums, so uh, that's his sister, MG Bassett. So uh, also directed Solomon Kane. He did, yeah. Of mine. yeah. West Country hero, can't go wrong there. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, I remember him mentioning that she was going to direct a couple of episodes, and uh, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't I'd clock it at the time that she'd actually directed. The first episode where I think it really gets going, I think it's, I think it's one where there's some uh, inventive future torture, arena style action, and um, uh, and I think that 
Well, yeah, it was episode three that, that she directed. Because I just started watching episode three and four. Three. I think. I think it's three was Nightmare Alley. Yeah. But um, so I've just started watching that episode. I'm starting. I was watching it last night. I shall finish it off before I go to yeah. sleep. <laughs> I, I mean, for for me, I think that the show does really well when it leaves the uh, Blade Runner universe and goes to like the forest for tales of Inan and, and and you know people getting massacred, the rebellion, and connection with funny trees, which or alien artifacts. But um, but I love. I mean, I love the universe. I love what they've done with it. And the action is still very cool, the way they kind of nail it. The new guy, Carrera, and Carrera's Wedge, with his team of, you know, impossibly good fighters. I mean, Phil, you've got to get on this. There's no... Yeah, you know, it's just finding, like I say, it's finding the time cards, but I'm going to try and make an effort and uh, and try and catch up with it and, and get on with it. It's just, it's, you know, it's like... Well, no, you don't, because you sit and watch TV all day. <laughs> yeah, I think we tempted you last time, but then told you you had to pay attention. And yeah, so it that's, went from... that's probably the thing, yeah. 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 Well, no. I've got a what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that. Actually, there was a couple that I've forgotten. Have you, have you done your bit, Kaz? Yeah. Yeah, right. So, uh, Life Cinematic, only three episodes, Steve. I, I thought it was originally supposed to be five, but yeah, they only did three in the end, or they've only broadcast three so far. Yeah, um, I, did, I did not like the guy interviewing... Um, uh, um, Oh Christ, his name's just gone out my head. Edgar Wright. Edgar Wright. I did not like I'll the guy what, interviewing him. The guy interviewing Edgar Wright is six foot seven, uh, Bobby Collins, and, and Edgar Wright's about five foot four. <laughs> uh, they should have sat them down. It looked, it looked, it looked, like, it looked like it looked like Edgar Wright was at the bottom of a well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, it was, it was enjoyable. I I didn't like his interviewing style. That's that kind of no, put me off. Um, the other girl, the girl who did the first and last, the first and last, what well, the first yeah. and third ones was better I thought I don't know why they didn't keep with the same um, yeah. same presenter but uh, it's, it is interesting when they pick these scenes and explain why you know, why they're important and, and, and you sort of pick up I love picking apart films and the and, and the, uh, the sort of you know the mechanics yeah. of cinema yeah. why, why they use a certain colour and a shade yeah, and why yeah. they do it this way and why they're using yeah. this piece of music and yeah um, anybody else catch Frankie Boyle's Tour of Scotland no no well worth a watch actually um, even if you don't like him He's, he's actually. I like Frankie Boyle. I just didn't fancy seeing him doing a, doing a documentary about Scotland. It, it's actually, I, it's actually I very, very Frankie entertaining. Boyle, but at the moment he grates a little. We're talking about someone who made some of the edgiest comments on terrestrial television of the last 15 years, now telling everyone to be nice and policing other people on social media. Mm. I find that at best to be. Charming. Yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from. He's, he's a like I say, he, he stepped back a little bit from that with this, but his his way of explaining Scotland and Scottish things is really entertaining and um, looking at old history and, and all the rest of it. And it's it's on the point. I mean, I don't know if you ever watched his stuff that you only ever did on iPlayer, um, uh, where where he gets quite political, but it's really clever. The way he, he's a very, very clever comedian, I think. I think a lot of people just know him because of his edgy comments on Mock the Week and that kind of thing. There's more to him than that, I think. And uh, I was more thinking of uh, Tramadol Nights, which right, was yeah. essentially Tramadol Nights was an attempt to look at Chris Morris's jam and go, How can I be even more unsettling than this without <laughs> necessarily looking at what Chris Morris had done? Yeah. With 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 jam that uh, the, I mean, it, we'll say there were moments of Tramadol nights. I mean, the the Michael Knight thing where he was the Knight Rider thing where he was just off his face um, was very amusing. Still find that very amusing to this day. Um, can we just say I uh, just say just something that has it's not te- te- television in the classic sense, but do you know you're on social media and every now and again someone will post this vi- video of a recipe. And it goes on for about three times longer than you think, and it gets more and more horrific the longer it goes on. It's like add five pounds of butter or encase this chicken entirely in a block of cheddar or whatever. I finally tracked down where they come from, which is a site, uh, an Instagram page called Chef's Club. Um, and uh, I've been watching them principally because they're an incredible appetite suppressant. Um, if you are looking for a way to uh, avoid wanting to eat anything, actually for quite sustained periods of time, it's well worth a look because it's crimes against food. Um, what's even more extraordinary is they appear to be French. 
I mean, I had assumed that they were from, you know, Iowa or somewhere else with a, <laughs> an interesting attitude towards saturated fat. But no, it's a, it's a French organisation. I mean, there's one doing the rounds at the moment where they're slicing up hot dog sausages with a paper clip and turning them into sort of waffles. I mean, if that doesn't already unsettle you, I don't know what, what I can say <laughs> to make it. But, but nevertheless, I, I, I'm afraid I watched their whole pages worth of stuff. I lost an entire evening to it, but I didn't eat. So, you know, it's quite handy. I did uh, follow a recommendation of yours, Ed, and watch the first episode of um, Roast Battle, or whatever it's called, with yeah. um, Phil Wang, and that, uh, that was... That line, the line that we probably can't say on the podcast, because only Phil Wang can realistically say it. Is that the one about how, uh, eating? Yeah, that was really funny. <laughs> no, the whole thing was funny, but that was, that was that, yeah, that was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> single greatest comeback I think it's now gone off now TV which is a shame but um, but nevertheless yes that's all good well uh, on Tuesday I think it's Tuesday um, the, the trip's back the trip in Greece uh, and that's a brilliant show as well with Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon never gotten oh. into that yeah you know my feelings on Steve Coogan <laughs> yeah I know your feelings on Steve Coogan but I, I enjoy it it's more of the same it's just the pair of them going to our restaurants and doing imp- impressions and trying to outdo one another but it's, it's, it's funny it's, it's kind of you know, gentle comedy that's um, did you see David Baddiel's thing about the Holocaust? I did, yes, I did, which was funny. really good. Wasn't it? It, <laughs> yeah. it? It's one of these tricky tricky subjects to cover, and I thought you did it really well. And, um, and it made clear that the problem nowadays, when I was a kid, you'd, you'd hear about Holocaust deniers, but they were basically issuing pamphlets and were complete nutters on the fringe of society. But thanks to the internet, that's, that kind of nonsense has now become mainstream, um, and people yeah. believe all the shit they see on the internet and on YouTube. And uh, yeah, it's it's worrying. Yeah. Like these flat earthers and stuff. Despite oh, yes. all the evidence to the contrary. <laughs> well, that, that, that flat earther and his steam powered rocket. That, yeah. that, that, that unfortunately for him did not go terribly well. No. In, in the immortal words of Sean Connery, I can't show you, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> on and on show. that, that, yeah. <laughs> Before we go any further, uh, that's it for this week. My thanks to Ed Sally. There's a lot of switches and stuff. Proud of the Pacific. Kaz Hallow. You are so beautiful it hurts. And Steve Withers. I think World War Two just started. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. A book of my you forums for this reviews, news, and video. And plus, why not leave us a five star rating on iTunes? But only if you enjoyed the show. Also, head over and check out our YouTube channel for videos and the latest product launches and reviews. And while you're there, feel free to subscribe. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Yeah.